Um, let's uh, open with prayer. Our Father, we uh, thank you for the uh, sunshine, sunshine and the spring flowers and especially the celebration of Christ's death and resurrection, knowing that uh, our entire faith is based upon what he did for us to save us all from uh, our sinful nature. Please be with us this morning as we continue to study Christ's last words on the cross. In thy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we have a lot of Bible verses this morning, uh, so we'll be uh, running through that. It seems like this uh, simple statement of I thirst, which is uh, we have one more, one more Sunday on the last words of Christ, and then we'll get back into the Minor Prophets with Nahum, but uh, this statement, I thirst, uh, is recorded in the Bible only in the book of John, and um, there's a lot of, if you think about it, why, why would John put <laughs> that simple statement uh, in his narrative about uh, Christ's last week here on earth? So there are several interpretations to that. Um, I, I guess I probably knew, but I didn't kind of put it all together. But do you know that there are at least three of the three occasions on which Christ was offered something to drink during this period? Three different occasions. Um, and so we're going to go over those three this morning, and then we'll spend the most of the time talking about John's uh, description. Uh, the first one is, uh, before he was even placed on the cross, he was offered a drink of, um, find it up here. He was offered a drink um, of wine with myrrh or gall. Um, and um, gall or myrrh was a... Uh, essentially a narcotic. Um, it, it would have um, dulled his senses and uh, permitted him to uh, experience all the physical torture of the crucifixion. And so it's interesting when he was offered that, what he did with it. So the first verse that we're gonna look at is in Mark chapter 15. Verse 22, um, Matthew offers a similar thing, but he says it was with uh, gall instead of myrrh. Um, so I'm in Mark chapter 15, verse 22. And so they came at last to the execution site, a hill called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. The soldiers offered Jesus wine mixed with myrrh to dull his pain, but he refused it. Now, I don't think the soldiers would have, on their own initiative, offered this drink. I think it was probably the women who were following Christ. Remember, all the men kind of disappeared. We don't know if any of them were in the crowd, but we really don't know that. Uh, so I, I think the women, in feeling compassion for Christ, wanted him not to suffer the way he would have suffered uh, or did suffer. Uh, and so they probably gave the wine with the gall to the soldiers to give to him. The other description is in Matthew 27. Same, uh, same situation. Remember, Matthew and Mark uh, very much alike. Uh, actually, Matthew took most of a, a large portion of his uh, of his writing directly from Mark. So I'm in Matthew 27, verse 32. As they were walking, they found a man called Simon of Cyrene and they forced him to carry the cross. Eventually, they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. There they gave him a drink, wine mixed with bitter herbs. He tasted it but refused to drink it. So the important thing here is not so much that he was offered this drink, although we can see that as a compassionate action by probably the women. 
The important thing is here he refused it. He intentionally chose to suffer. He would face all the evil that humanity uh, had to offer, and he would suffer as long as it took him to die. So he could have taken an easy way out, but he didn't. Uh, he intended to fully identify with the suffering that we experience with as humans and to show what the cost of sin really was and how God chose to uh, grant us the grace that Christ provided. Uh, then there was a second offer of, uh, of something to drink, and that's in Luke 23. So if you'd go with me to Luke 23... Um, and this time it's verse 36. And again, we need to understand, this time it is the soldiers that are offering him the drink, um, but it's, in a, it's a mocking sort of thing. He, uh, as, as you'll hear in my uh, version of the story, uh, they're doing a fake toast to this king of the Jews. So this is not a kind thing they're doing. It's a, it's a, it's a sarcastic, um, evil kind of thing that they're uh, offering. Uh, they're mocking Jesus, and they offered him this drink of wine as if it were a toast. And uh, it's uh, unlikely that Jesus could have even swallowed this stuff. I don't know if any of us have ever attempted to drink vinegar, but that's essentially what wine turns into when it goes bad. Uh, and so, uh, what did I say it was? Uh, Luke 23, verse 36. The soldiers joined in the mockery. First, they pretended to offer him a soothing drink, but it was sour wine. The soldiers said, hey, if you're the king of the Jews, why don't you free yourself? And so they were mocking him. So first, uh, it was uh, some wine with uh, narcotic that was uh, provided probably by the women through the soldiers before he went to the place of his death. And then while he was hanging on the cross, the soldiers were mocking him. So the third situation is uh, comes to us. Um, it's actually recorded in Matthew, Mark, and John, but Matthew and Mark, uh, after Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The response to the cry was to offer Jesus uh, a sponge with some wine on a long stick. So let's go to Mark chapter 15 again. And this time we're in verse 33. At noon today suddenly darkened for three hours across the entire land. Sometime around three o'clock, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Aloy, Aloy, Lama Sabachthani. Jesus was speaking as in the Psalms. My God, my God, why have you turned your back on me? Some of those standing nearby misunderstood him. The bystander said, hey, he's calling for Elijah. One of them filled a sponge with wine that, turned to vinegar, that had turned to vinegar and lifted it to Jesus' lips on a stick so that he could drink. They said, let's see if Elijah will come to take him down. Then Jesus cried out with a loud voice, and he took his last breath. Well, John's version is different. And John's version um, has a couple of differences. Number one, it's, it's, it's recorded, and John says, so that the scriptures may be fulfilled. And the other thing is, instead of a long pole, the uh, sponge with wine was uh, attached to a hyssop branch. So let's go to John and... Read that. That's in John chapter 19, uh, verse 28. Jesus knew now that his work had been accomplished and the Hebrew scriptures were being fulfilled. So there's one difference. A jar of sour wine that had been left there, so they took a hyssop branch with a sponge soaked in the vinegar and put it to his mouth. Well, instead of a long pole, it's a hyssop branch. Anybody know what hyssop looks like? <laughs> I've, I, I, I googled it, and I have a picture of it. There are a little bit of conjectures about what 
Uh, most of the HISA plants that I, I'll show you later uh, look like that, but they also said that the HISA in Palestine area is different. But I did. <laughs> there were so many pictures of pretty flowers that I thought I would I would pick that one instead. So we'll we'll talk about that in a minute. So um, let's uh, let's talk about the interpretation of the scripture in this scene. Um, there are three things that we can talk to about this. Number one is Jesus. Jesus said, "I thirst," and Paul and John was trying to say this is an indication of Jesus' humanity. The second thing that John is trying to say, we we know that Christ talked about, "I am the living water," and uh, Jesus uh, was realizing or finally came to the conclusion that his mission was complete here on earth to bring the story of Christ of God's kingdom to earth. And so um, his mission of bringing living water to the people was complete. And the third thing is that Jesus reminds us that the only satisfying thing in life um, is him. So let's look at a little bit, each of those three things in a little bit more detail. Um, remember, back in Christ's day, what we have as orthodoxy today was not there. In other words, there were a lot of reasons, a lot of opinions about what Christ's death and his life was at the time. For example, uh, the Greeks, some of the Greeks said that Christ really wasn't a human being. He was really a spirit that appeared to be human. Now, the importance of all this is that if Christ was not a human and divine, then his resurrection would not be, a, would not have cleansed us of our sins. So if you think back to the temple worship and the sacrifices that were made. They were unblemished animals that were killed, and then the blood was sprinkled on the altar, and that sacrifice um, absolved the sins of whoever the sacrifice was for at the time. Well, um, so the importance of and our beliefs today that Christ was fully human and fully divine is very significant in terms of the sacrifice that he made, the one and only sacrifice. If he were not human, he would not have suffered. And if he were not divine, he could not have taken on all the sins of the world. So those were established over the centuries after Christ's death. So at the time, there were other explanations. And so John is trying in this first thing to say he was human. He was thirsty. He had been standing or been hanging on the cross for several hours, and that would be a natural human function. If he were not human, he would not have uttered those things. So what are some of the things? As I said, the Greeks said that um, he was merely a spirit. Um, some said that it really wasn't Jesus, that uh, the Son of Man would never would have allowed himself to die on the cross. And some have proposed that uh, it was really Simon of Cyrene that took Jesus' place on the cross. The Gnostics believed that, for example, that Christ was not uh, divine until his baptism. And he was divine from his baptism until just before his death on the cross. And that allowed him to perform all the miracles. So that he really wasn't divine when he died on the cross. The Muslims, for example, um, believed that Jesus was taken down from the cross before he died. And others believed that Jesus was taken into heaven before he died. So... All of those things were in play at the time. And if you read Paul and James and some of the other New Testament writers, they offer explanations in contrast to 
what the Gnostics believed, for example, and what some of these other beliefs were. And so Christianity, orthodoxy, the things that we believe today actually were developed, I don't know if that's the right word, but actually came into being through the writings of the early gospel writers, through Paul, and later things that happened. The Apostles' Creed, for example, didn't occur until I think it was like 300 AD. And there were a lot of, there was a lot of controversy about what the Apostles' Creed said. So the point is that John was trying to make it a point in his writing that Christ was fully human when he died on the cross. That's an important aspect of what we believe today. And the way he did that was to say that I'm thirsty. That's what a human being would have said. Now, the second interpretation of this, um, well, one other thing. Remember, all these other ideas about what, who and what Christ was on the cross came from people who were not eyewitnesses, right? Muhammad, who started Islam, um, was around about uh, 600 AD, so 600 years after the birth of Christ. And so we're reading John, right? Who was at, who was at <laughs> the crucifixion? John. He was an eyewitness to what took place. So his understanding of what was happening at the cross, uh, who would you rather believe? The people who were there at the time? or people who developed these ideas who had not witnessed what had taken place. So, um, Jesus' words, I thirst, is just another example of Christ's humanity. Um, and it demonstrated that Jesus died on the cross, um, absorbing all of that anguish and torture uh, by refusing, remember the first time, refusing to drink the wine, to dull his senses, he wanted to make sure that he suffered in the way we suffer so that we can look to him as a perfect example of what humanity can do and the grace that God has given us. So let's look at the second interpretation of this I thirst. That is, Jesus finished his cup, his mission. Uh, <clears throat> Um, he completed his mission to suffer and die on the cross on the behalf of human beings. And oftentimes he used uh, water or thirst or drinking as a <clears throat> metaphor for his suffering. So let's look at a few examples in the scriptures about uh, how Jesus did that and when he did it. So the first one is in Matthew 26. Uh, verse 27. And this is a familiar, um, you know, he's at the, at, the, <clears throat> at the Last Supper with his disciples. And um, having completed his suffering, he was now thirsty. So I'm in uh, Matthew 26, verse 27. And then he took the cup of wine, he made a blessing over it, and he passed it around the table. Jesus said, take this and drink, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. But I tell you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine again until I am with you once more, drinking in the kingdom of my Father. So simple things. We heard that this morning during the, during the communion. Another good example is in Matthew 20. So if you go back a few pages to verse 20. Matthew 20, verse 20. <clears throat> As Jesus was speaking about the things that were to come, Zebedee's wife, whose sons were among Jesus' disciples, came to Jesus with her sons and knelt down before him to ask a favor. Remember, Pastor talked about that <laughs> this morning. Uh, one of the three people that, you know, those asking for power. Jesus said, what do you want? This was James and John, remember. 
their mother. When the kingdom of, of God is made manifest, I want one of my boys, James and John, to sit at your right hand and one to sit at your left hand. Jesus said to all three, you don't understand what you are asking. Can you drink the cup I'm about to drink? So what's he talking about? He's talking about his suffering, right? Can you do and, and could you do what I'm going to do? Can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? Can you be ritually washed in baptism just as I've been baptized? And the brothers say, of course. And Jesus responds and says, yes, you will drink from my cup. And yes, you will be baptized as I have been. But the thrones to my right and my left are not mine to grant. My father has already given those seats to those to whom they were created. So when he says, yeah, you're going to drink like I drink, what's he talking about? He's talking about, yes, they're going to suffer. After he dies and the, and the disciples disperse to the all parts of the world, every one of them, except for John, were martyred. Some awful deaths, cut in half, you know, just uh, skinned alive. Those are some of the traditions and so Christ said, yes. Uh, first he said, can you, can you drink what I'm going to drink? In other words, can you suffer the way I'm going to suffer? And then he says, but you will. <laughs> he promises, yes, you will. Um, so the second interpretation is that the cup of suffering and sin that he had willingly taken on was now empty. His time of suffering was drawn to a close. Now, the third um, idea, okay, so this is, again, a picture from uh, the French artist Tussaud. He's got some really interesting things. If you, if you Google him, you can get a chance to see. I, I think it's some, it's some phenomenal number of, photo, of uh, photo, uh, paintings that he has, he has done about the life of Christ. Um, mm -hmm. But in this one... Um, the fountain of living water has dried up. Um, there's only one other time uh, in his life that, um, oh, this is, this is the picture of uh, him receiving uh, water on a stick, right, on a stick. Uh, in the next one, this is a woman at the well. A very, uh, you probably remember the story. It's in John chapter 4, so we're going to read that. And it's uh, 4 through 14. Um, you know, water is essential for life. You, you can go for weeks without food, but you can only get three to five days really without water. Uh, and there's only one other time in the Bible where Christ said he wanted to drink. In other words, to indicate that he was thirsty. And it's here with this woman at the well. And Jesus explains in the scripture that he is the living water. It's clear that he considers himself the essential of life. In other words, we can't live without water. Christ is telling this woman at the well, you can't live without me. So what does it mean to say that Jesus, the fountain of living water, is thirsty? So we'll get into that in a minute. But let's read the story here about his, uh, as, as this picture indicates. Uh, this was a trip that would take them through Samaria. So Christ and his disciples were going through Samaria. Remember that? They didn't like Samaritans. And so it was unusual for them to make, it, make their trip to Jerusalem through this part of, usually they walked down the eastern side of the Jordan. This time they were going through Samaria. In a small Samaritan town known as Sychar, Jesus and his entourage stopped to rest at the historic well that Jacob gave his son Joseph. It was about noon when Jesus found his spot to sit close to the well while the disciples ventured off to find provisions. From his vantage, he watched as a Samaritan woman approached to draw some water. Unexpectedly, he spoke to her. So first of all, a couple of unusual things. Number one, the woman was by herself. So she obviously was shunned by the other women for some reason. And the other thing is she was unaccompanied by a male, and so it wasn't appropriate for a male at that time to talk to an unaccompanied female. So it kind of surprised her. And Jesus said, would you draw me water and give me a drink? So he asked, he asked for a drink. He's thirsty. The woman says, I can't believe that you, a Jew, would associate with me as a Samaritan woman, much less ask me to give you a drink. Jesus said, Jews, you see, have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus said, you don't know the gift of God 
or who is asking you for a drink of this water from Jacob's well? Because if you did, you would have asked him for something greater, and he would have given you the living water. Now, living water is a, is a term that means more than just what the implication is. Living water was water that was moving. It was water from a stream. It wasn't st st uh, stagnant. stagnant water like that would exist in a, in a pond or a river, in a pond or a lake. This was moving water. This was life-giving water. And, G and the woman says back to him, Sir, you sit by this deep well, a thirsty man without a bucket in sight. Where does this living water come from? Are you claiming superiority to our father Jacob, who labored long and hard to dig and maintain this well so that he could share clean water with his sons, grandchildren, and cattle? And Jesus said, Drink this water, and your thirst is quenched only for a moment. You must return to this well again and again. I offer water that will become a wellspring within you that gives life throughout eternity. You will never be thirsty again. And we know from the story that she gets converted and she knows that Jesus is the Messiah and she is a missionary to the Samaritans. And so she runs off to the town and tells her story and brings them all back to Christ. And, you know, it's interesting, two of the most... Uh, Successful missionaries were this woman, a Samaritan who the Jews hated, and then the demonic who Christ went to on the east side of the Sea of Galilee, uh, and this crazy man who he took the demons out, put them in a, in a herd of pigs, and they all, right? And that man also went and was a missionary to all of the pagans, the Gentiles who lived on that side of the Sea of Galilee. So it's, it's kind of amazing how non-Jews listened and acted on Christ's message, and the Jews, to whom he gave his message first, rejected him. So the question is, um, why, would, why would Jesus um, equate this uh, living water with being thirsty? And I, I've got two verses that kind of might help us with that. One's in Psalm chapter 42. Uh, first couple verses. It says uh, in Psalm 42, it says, My soul is dry and thirst for you, true God, as a deer thirsts for water. I long for the true God who lives. When can I stand before him and feel his comfort? And I think perhaps an even better one is in Isaiah chapter 41. Um When Christ says, I thirst, he, I, I, John is trying to tell us that he's human. But the second thing, we know that Christ knew the scriptures very well. A couple times, right? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That came from the Psalms. And we're going to find out that next Sunday that one of the things he says comes from the Psalms. So I, I kind of think that he might have been praying again. He might have been thinking about what we're about to read in the book of Isaiah. And so listen to what this says. And can you think of Christ as he's dying on the cross, recalling the scripture from Isaiah, and then kind of summarizing it by say, I thirst. So I'm in Isaiah 41, verse 17. And when people thirst, and when those poor souls with parched tongues look in vain for something to drink, I, the eternal, the God of Israel, won't lead them to suffer. I will respond by making the hard brown hills sparkle with streams of fresh water and causing valleys to come alive with springs. I will see that the gentle pools wait on the desert floor for the weary traveler. The great fountains bubble up from the dry ground. In the desert, I will plant cedars and woody arcadias, myrtles and olive branches. I will establish great cypresses to flourish in the desert places, plant oaks and pine trees side by side. They see all this and understand. They'll ponder together and come to know that is the power of the eternal one of God that produced this. They will know that the Holy One of Israel created it. And so maybe he was, in a sense, praying, I thirst, because he knew that 
the people at the foot of the cross and us today that the only thing that's satisfying our thirst for life is Jesus. Not a promotion, not a new car, not a house. Um, it was a prayer, I think, in a way that Jesus uttered to recall these words on Isaiah that being thirsty is to thirst for God's power and strength and his grace and his protection. One more interpretation. Let's talk about this hyssop plant. Um, I've got a picture of a hyssop plant. They don't look very strong, so you probably had to bind them together and uh, put something on a sponge. They perhaps had, didn't even have flowers on it because you know when plants get dry and they're past their prime, they're brittle, right? And they're stiffer. Um, so only John adds to the detail that says Jesus was offered wine from a soaked sponge on the end of his plant. Now, <laughs> why would he say that? Um, there are a couple places in the Bible that hyssop is mentioned. The first one is in Leviticus, uh, chapter 14. Now, remember, Leviticus were the, was the guidance that God gave Moses on how the Israelites were, were to carry out their rituals and, and honoring God. And... <clears throat> If somebody needed to be cleansed, and in this case, it's somebody with a disease, um, they had to be cleansed of the disease before they could participate in temple worship again. So listen to the directions that the priests are supposed to have for this person. And I'll read the first uh, eight, six verses. So these are the instructions for determining when an infected person has recovered from a skin disease and should be pronounced clean. The priest must go outside the camp and examine the infected person. Remember, they're, they're wandering in the wilderness now. So when they say outside the camp, that's what they're talking about. If the priest determines that the skin disease has been healed, then he will prescribe two healthy birds, both ritually pure, some cedar wood, scarlet string, and a hyssop be brought for the cleansing ritual. The priest will direct that one of the birds be killed in a clay jar over running water, he will then take the living bird along with the cedar, the scarlet string, and the hyssop and dip them in the blood of the first bird killed over the running water. So hyssop is used to cleanse a person, of, in this case, of a skin disease so that they, again, participate. They would be clean and they could participate in temple worship. Or well, in this case, in the tabernacle worship because they're out in the desert. Um... The story we all know is the first Passover in Egypt. Remember, Moses is trying to get the, the, the slavery Jews out of Pharaoh's grasp. And it's the last plague that's going to come on Pharaoh. And remember, the angel of death is going to pass over the land and all firstborn, humans, cattle, animals, are all going to die unless... They follow the directions that Moses gives his people, which is in Exodus chapter 12, verse 21. Then Moses called all of the Israel's elders together and gave them instructions. Moses said, go and pick out lambs for each of your families and then slaughter your family's Passover lamb. Then take a handful of hyssop branches, dip them down into the bowl of blood you drain from the sacrifice, and mark the top of the doorway and two doorposts with blood from the bowl. After you do this, no one shall go out that door until the next morning. God will pass through the land during the night and bring death to the Egyptians. But when he sees the blood markings across the tops of your doorways and down your two doorposts, he will pass over your houses and not allow his messenger of death to enter into your house and strike you down. So they use hyssop branches on the on the doorpost um, to put the blood as the markers so that the angel of death would pass over their house. So the hyssop branch that John remarks in, I don't know, I mean, he was there, right? So it must have been a hyssop branch. 
Um, but the important thing is that John is pointing out the meaning of Jesus' death. Just as the hyssop branch and the blood on the doorpost meant that the angel of death passed over, there was no death, he's initiating with that a new covenant with God and humanity, cleansing all who will trust him. And so using the hyssop branch in Christ's death is kind of the same representation that the hyssop branch was used when it, it marked the Passover of the angel of death back in, the, in, uh, in Egypt, back in Moses' day. Um, so who do you think is going to offer Christ water today? How, we, we can't, right? Christ is gone. <laughs> if he says, I'm thirsty, we can't, we can't offer him thirst. But he gave us some direction in Matthew 25 when he says this. in verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in all his majesty, accompanied by throngs of heavenly messengers, his throne will be wondrous. All the nations will assemble before him, and he will judge them, distinguishing them one from another as a shepherd isolates the sheep from the goats. And the king will say, Come here, you beloved people, you who, who my father has blessed, calm your inheritance. You shall be richly rewarded for what for when I was hungry you fed me, and when I was thirsty you gave me something to drink. I was alone as a stranger, and you welcomed me into your home and into your lives. I was naked and you gave me clothes to wear. I was sick and you intended to my and you tended to my needs. I was in prison and you comforted me. Well, how do we provide that thirst today to Christ is by offering those kinds of things to people that we come in contact with today. Uh, what I'd like to do now, um, let's, uh, we'll bow our heads in prayer and close, and then I have a short 10 minute video from Adam Hamilton that I think you'll, you'll enjoy that he talks about uh, Christ's words, I thirst. Let's bow our heads. Our Father, uh, thank you for being with us here this morning. Guide and bless each and every one of us, and may we understand what John mentioned when he said the words that Christ, when he repeated the words that Christ said on the cross, I thirst, that um, we are saved and cleansed um, by his blood, that uh, <clears throat> like the hyssop plant, uh, God is... Uh, providing us grace and forgiving us our sins um, as uh, he saved the people of uh, Moses' time by the angel of death passing over their house. Be with each and every one of us today uh, and throughout the rest of this week and bring us back again safely next Sunday. In thy name we pray. Amen. Amen.